is your program of choice, Health Affair on AIT, a platform where we focus on public health challenges, issues about women and children with a view to providing lasting solutions. I am your regular uncle, Ushuomo Daniels. As a densely populated nation, Nigeria has been tagged as the leading African country in human trafficking. How this affects the female gender and children, as well as some of the health implications, is the focus of today's program. But first is the news segment. The story of Christabel Miriam, a Port Arcot based beauty queen in her late 20s, broke out on various social media platforms early in the month of June 2022. She was said to have visited a popular beauty clinic in Maryland area of Lagos State for a breast and bum enlargement. Unfortunately, luck ran out of her as she died four days after the procedure from alleged complications by a friend. The surgery was successful because immediately after the surgery, that same day she was able to eat soon after surgery. In fact, we don't have any reason to not make them eat. And then she was able to ambulate. She was able to start moving from the following day. She was also able to go to the toilet or go to the, the bathroom herself and come back unaided. We have CCTV footages of her moving around within the facility. And I could actually let you have access to that. So to see her on the second day post-op, she was already ambulating, moving freely without any support. Now from the second day, even up to the last day, I have submitted myself to the police, the health facility monitoring and accreditation agency, as well as to the Lagos State Blood Transfusion Services for investigations as a law-abiding citizen who is the doctor accused of the death of my client four days after her procedure. Representatives from these agencies have already visited our facility for a thorough information gathering as expected of them. Let me once again express my heartfelt condolences to the elderly parents, the siblings, the relatives, friends, and well-wishers of our late client. It is on a very sad note that I comment on the demise of our dear client, which occurred on the 31st of May, 2022. Since the demise of Christabel, there have been counter allegations from family members, friends, and responses on social media accusing the surgeon of negligence. Ensure that I do not reveal details of the medical information and history of our client. It has equally become necessary a response to certain unfounded insinuations, misinformation, and accusations going around following her passing. It is unfortunate that while the families of the deceased are grieving, some persons are going about pointing accusations at me and raising doubts on my professional qualifications with regards to the handling of my client, now deceased. As a law-abiding and patriotic citizen of this great country, Nigeria, I am also following through to exhaust all legal and professional investigation processes on this unfortunate incident. I enjoy the family of the deceased, my family and friends, as well as professional colleagues to be patient while these investigations are being conducted. I'm sure that at the end, I will be exonerated of all accusations in the matter. No doubt the police investigations, which have since commenced, are already revealing the truth. And the true fact of the matter, as there are enough evidence, including CCTV footages, and the statement of the only friend who visited my client while on admission. I will not want to comment further on this at this time. I trust the police and my professional colleagues will do a thorough job and will be discreet in their investigations, which include an autopsy 
and toxicology of all relevant samples. Although AIC crew has not been able to reach the relatives as at the time of this report, we got across to the police public relations officer, Benjamin Undei, to get their accounts of the story. Benjamin told AIT in the telephone conversation that they have only read about the story on social media as nobody has officially reported to them. Critical issues and challenges confronting players in the nation's pharmaceutical sector as regards local manufacturing of medicines and vaccines will be brought to the fore at the 25th Annual National Conference of Association of Industrial Pharmacists of Nigeria, NIAP, tagged ECO 2022. Speaking at a briefing with newsmen, the National Chairman of the Association, Ken Onwebu, of the members of the Planning Committee, gave an insight to the theme of the event, the role of industrial pharmacists in a depressed economy, opportunities, challenges and solutions in providing essential drugs. Under the new administration, this will be our first um, annual conference. Uh, you will recall that um, we had our general election last year during the 24th conference at Marriott Hotel. And we had our elections and uh, the new ESCO took over. Since then, it has been one activity or the other, trying as much as possible to steal the ship. And um, I want to give God the glory that we have successfully done that for the past one year almost. And uh, here we come again with our 25th um, annual conference. The theme will be the role of industrial pharmacists in a depressed economy, opportunities, challenges, and solutions in providing essential drugs. Why this topic? You will agree with me that we have um, quite a lot of challenges in the country following the COVID-19 era. A lot of issues came up. Medicine, drug security is very, very important. So in the midst of all these challenges, what are the what should, are supposed to be the roles of uh, pharmacists in ensuring adequate drug and medicine security in the country? Uh, so we are bringing in on that particular day one of our top entrepreneurs who has actually paid the necessary dues in the pharmaceutical sector, Dr. Ifani Okoyo, the MD of uh, Juhel, will be coming all the way from Enugu to do justice to this particular topic. And I can assure you, honestly, it's going to be a very rewarding experience. The chairman of that day, which is the opening day, the opening day will be on 15th, and 15th is precisely Wednesday. The chairman of the opening ceremony will be our former president, Ahmed Yakasai, MPSM. He will be the chairman of the occasion. And um, thereafter, after the keynote address, we have lined up some other very rewarding topics that touches on one or two primary challenges we are having in the industry. And uh, one of them is uh, what we call a uh, professional collaboration and coordination. Engagement, you know. And the only way we can make a quantum leap and address some of our inherent challenges, honestly, is to engage ourselves, collaborate with our partners, wherever they may be. And for that topic, uh, we are also bringing in a renowned professor and the vice chairman of Fernando Zico University, Professor Isimone, uh, Charles Isimone, uh, the fellow of the society. He will be there that day also to handle uh, to that particular topic. On the second day, which is uh, precisely Thursday, um, we are also bringing in one of our highly respected pharmacists, Olakunde Ekundayo, a fellow of the society, is going to be the chairman of that particular day. And that day we are going to have a very key plenary session. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people come to conference for uh, uh, and various people come to conference for various reasons. Some people come to conference to network. Some people come to conference to interact. And some people come to gain more knowledge that will help their practice. Some people also come to meet older colleagues, friends, 
in school, and also uh, uh, some people use it as a vacation uh, 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 time. Okay, having all this in mind, we have we are putting up a conference that will take care of all the various interests of our colleagues. Looking at our topics vis-a-vis -vis what is happening in the country right now, you will understand that we selected a topic that will take care of the concerns and the yearnings of the industrial farms. And we also carefully selected speakers that are going to do justice to that topic. Uh, you, 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 you look at uh, the, 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 the person that is taking our keynote address, it's a renowned pharmaceutical industrialist that has survived the, 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 the struggle and the pressure of running business in Nigeria, Dr. Ifan Chuku Okoye. And if you look at uh, our sub-team, or our main team for the second day, which is technology, regulation, data centricity, and all that, we in the industry, we all realize that we are being over-regulated. So we carefully chose that topic to discuss issues of regulation. Why are we, why are we having issues with NAVDAC, customs, MDLEA, and the policymaker CPM? If you solve an issue from NAVDAC, then the other parties in the regulation are also not seeing what you're doing with a particular parastatal. That is why we chose data centricity. Because if we have an avenue where data are open and shared within our regulators, they will, will not be having the kind of issues we are having. Our system, the industry, is passing through evolution. And for us to get where we are supposed to be, data is key, technology is key, and our being overregulated is something we have to look into. So we are bringing all these people, delegations from custom, our policymakers, CBA, we are bringing in MDLEA that keeps disturbing our colleagues on the road. We are also bringing in NAVDAC to be able to discuss this topic and we will work out a, 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 a communique that can form a working document. The event is slated to hold from 14th to 16th June 2022 at the Providence Hotel Ikeju, Lagos. People that are coming to relax, we have also taken care of the organization. We are going to have an arrival cocktail where colleagues can network, discuss, then on our opening day, after the pressures of the opening day, we are also going to have our social nights where we can unwind and relax. You know, people say uh, 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 all work and no play makes that a dull boy. But we are all men now. So we say if you walk without relaxation, you get sad and you get great. Okay? So we have taken care of our relaxation. And in, the, in our programs, we don't want it to sound so very academic. So we have also you know, uh, 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 included some interludes that will help our colleagues relax, follow the program, and enjoy the program. The Association of Industrial Pharmacists of Nigeria, NIAP, is a technical arm of the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria, PSN, and the professional body of all pharmacists in the industrial sector in Nigeria. Driven by a passion to promote oral health in Nigeria, members of the Nigerian Dental Federation, in collaboration with Unilever PLC, has begun its annual community health program, Talk to a Dentist, across all states of the Federation. The 2022 edition of the program saw thousands of people benefiting from free oral health interventions. The burden of oral diseases in Nigeria is still very much high and then that's why we are doing all this campaign to actually increase awareness of oral health of Nigerians. Uh, we, this has been our tradition over the years. We move all out to uh, various locations 
to educate members of the public on the importance of good oral hygiene. And um, from uh, our various findings, we still discover that the awareness is still low. Even with all the, the outreaches we have done, even with all the, the campaign, but we won't rest on our horse. We still need to, to do more. So, and essentially, the whole idea of uh, uh, this campaign. And then what we are really telling our members of the public is to visit the dentist. They shouldn't wait till they have problems before they go to the dental clinic, at least twice in a year, every six, six months, so that whatever issues are there, uh, it will be detected early and then it will be addressed before it becomes uh, uh, an issue. Again, our target audience is every Nigerian, be it young or old, students, our parents, workers, wherever you can reach a, a group of people, marketplace, what is happening here today is happening in other parts of the country. There are different locations, motor parks, churches or religious homes, um, uh, markets, schools like we are here. Very, very interesting. Very, very, at least this alone will save some parents the costs. Or give all good, better advice on how to really manage that it. I would appreciate if at all, if they can make this program a periodic one. Five every other six months. They visit the schools, and not only umbrella, other schools. And to educate parents and students on how to really manage and take care of our teeth. It will be a long way helping us to have stronger teeth and uh, fresh breath. We were supposed to brush two times a day. But because of everybody is too engaged in Nigeria, you find it very difficult for people to even stay at home to brush even once. Talk more of brushing two times in a day. I enjoy the program. I also enjoy the organization for coming down to use our school. Then to the students, I encourage them to wash their teeth daily, at least two times a day. Then to the staff, to do so also. And also, neighborhood and even other persons that came around, we should be very careful to take care of our teeth. The program also featured talks about common oral diseases, how to use the toothbrush, toothpaste distribution move, and lots more. The Guinness Book of Record has it that dental care, which is tooth decay, is the most common disease affecting man, followed by gum disease and halitosis in that order. So patients who come to see us in dental clinic, is either they have problem of tooth decay, gum disease, or they have mouth problem, what we call halitosis. So the disease of the teeth can be classified broadly for the purpose of this presentation, eco three. Those are fairly the hard tooth tissues. That is the teeth proper, which is supposed to be the hardest structure in the mouth. It is called dental caries, one of them, which is tooth decay. We have hypoplasia, which is a, more like a congenital malformation, where the enamel is properly formed. They have tooth colorations too. Then when you come to disease of the soft tissue, you have gum disease, which is gingivitis. When it's left for long, it will progress to periodontitis, where your mouth begin, your teeth begin to shake. And then we have the oral mucosal lesions which is quite a lot in number. Then we have others, which are grouped as oral cancers, tumors or cysts or butons, and then the facial infections, what we call the facial space infections. This is tooth anatomy. This is what the tooth looks like. Different layers of the tooth, the enamel, the dentin, the pulp, the gum, and so on. So that is it. Now, dental caries, which is tooth decay. We said it's the dissolution of the heart tissue. When the, when the hand tissue begins to dissolve, that is called dental caries, and it can lead to cavity formation. It affects every age, every sex, although it's said to be permanent in women, that's what study says. It gives pain, patients complain of pain, they cannot chew, and then sometimes, too, because there's cavity, food particles get lodged into the cavity, and there's offensive smell. And then sometimes, if it progresses, we can have some mandibular swelling. There's also loss of man manpower, so that Persons cannot do their work effectively as a consequence. Now, the development of dental caries is due to interplay of factors. We have one of such factors, substrate, what we call diet. And the diet in particular mainly refined sugars. You can see them on the screen. These are the things that can cause tooth decay when you eat a lot of it. And you don't clean your mouth very well and you don't uh, brush properly. Also, there is microorganisms. Essentially, this is bacteria that has to act on those particles to reduce to release acid, which will drop the pH of the mouth to give you.
truth will give. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to show us how to brush our teeth because I know if I should ask each and every one of us here, how do we brush our teeth? Majority of us will tell me this is the way you brush our teeth. Is it not the way you brush? Yes. yes. I know you will say no. Yes. But the proper way to brush our teeth is this way. You slightly open your mouth. Then you place your toothbrush against the gum and you sweep up gently. You sweep up. A toothbrush can cover three teeth at a time. So you sweep your teeth. After putting your face on your toothbrush, then you place it against the gum and you sweep up gently. You sweep up, you sweep up. Then the upper teeth, you sweep it down. You sweep it down gently, then the inner, you sweep it down, you sweep them out like this, you sweep it up. Then the grinding surface, which is the flat surface, you brush them outward, you brush it outward, and the upper one, you brush it the same way outward. Then don't forget the tongue, which happens to be the floor of the mouth, you brush it out gently, you know, it's soft, it's not like it is. To the left and to the right. You brush it the inner, then you brush it to the down. You brush it very well. Then you rinse your mouth very well and your toothbrush under running water. You dust it and you hang it in a brush hanger. If you don't have a brush hanger, put it in a cup. You know, if you have seen somebody that has a problem with gum, you will know that um, it's not really a, a good thing. So, our parents should please be conscious of what our children eat and also make sure that the proper things are done. Then, for the children, they should avoid smoking. The Nigerian Dental Association NDA is the umbrella association of all dentists practicing in the public and private sectors. It is a non-governmental organization dedicated to the advancement of the profession and achievement of optimal oral health care in Nigeria. Some health experts and researchers at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Luth, Idiaraba, have identified a worrisome trend in some patients that survived the COVID-19 virus infection termed post-COVID-19 syndrome. We have been observing and we have been seeing a large, fairly large number of patients who, after the COVID infections that they suffered, that after the severe acute phase, which is about four weeks after the infection, they have had some symptoms that have lingered and even acquired some more symptoms, you know, that are quite worrisome with some, you know, psychosocial um, undertone. For instance, they've been having some patients come with brain fog, inability to concentrate. They have problems with memory. Some of them have uh, problems with, with effort tolerance. They do a little thing, they get tired. Some have been having headaches. Some have been having abnormal sensations. So the symptoms are a whole lot of them that these patients are suffering from. People who have COVID are expected to recover within four weeks. Most people recover within a week of those who linger sometimes of the four weeks. But we'll say now that after after the four weeks, some people now develop either the completely new symptoms or persistence of the symptoms that they had before. The wide range of symptoms that have lasted that last beyond those first four weeks uh, of symptoms. I was saying that this is a big problem. It affects people's ability to be productive. It affects uh, people's uh, ability to carry on with their lives. You know, contrary to the expectation that COVID is something that you can just get for a few weeks and then go back you know, to your normal self. I've seen clearly that the group of people who have been unable to shake off that equity, and so this takes a huge toll, a you know, huge toll on that. The experts urged members of the public having any of the enumerated signs and symptoms to report to the hospital clinic on Wednesdays for urgent attention. So saying that we have a large group of people who have this and some don't even know that this was wrong with them. Um, the, some of the doctors they are meeting don't know that this was a problem, so they don't know how to treat them. So knowing that this problem is there, the uh, hospital in collaboration with um, researchers from the College of Medicine University of Lagos and Northwestern University in the United States have come together with the collaboration to both provide care to people who come with these challenges, linking them with the right specialists to provide the care they need, psychiatrists, neurologists, uh, uh, 
uh, respiratory physicians, even surgeons, to provide the care they need. But additionally, uh, we're putting together a research collaboration to find answers. Why do people that have long COVID have long COVID? Uh, what's, what's going on in their bodies? And what can be done about it you know, to solve that? So post, the, the post-COVID clinic in Loop actually runs on every Wednesday in the afternoon at 12 noon. And in that clinic is a multidisciplinary clinic where you have neurologists, you have um, um, the infectious disease specialist. And then by the time you are seen in that clinic, depending on what symptoms you have, you are segregated to any, whether cardiology, whether it's cardiothoracic, any of the special specialties where you can find help. Some of these patients, you know, have depression and then they get to see our psychologists, our psychiatrists and all of that. So it's a multidisciplinary clinic for patients with post-COVID and it runs every Wednesday. And then you can reach the clinic via phone numbers. So we have phone numbers where you can book your appointment ahead or you can walk in on a Wednesday, even without referral, you know, you'll be seen. And then you're sure you'll be seen by a consultant as well. The experts also called for continuous adherence to the COVID-19 prevention guidelines and other infectious diseases to avoid needless deaths and emerging syndrome. Okay, so what we learn, two things we learn from long COVID. One is that COVID is not just a long illness, it affects other parts of the body. Secondly, we also learn that COVID uh, is not a one-off illness, that we have symptoms that can be come afterwards. And those symptoms can be quite significant and uh, to affect you know, the quality of life uh, that people live. The COVID-19 pandemic has no doubt become a public health emergency that requires the effort of everyone in finding a lasting solution. So, to be a part of the solution, please comply with the safety rules, always. Wash your hands from time to time with flowing water and soap. Use your hand sanitizers. Use a nose mask when you're going out of your house. Prevention, they say, is better than cure. The average cost of treating cancer for an individual in Nigeria runs into millions of naira. In a country where the 30,000 naira minimum wage can barely feed a family and not fully implemented, this cost of treating cancer remains a big challenge and far beyond what many can handle. While many have advocated for the inclusion of cancer treatment in the National Health Insurance Scheme as the way forward, some Nigerian celebrities and medical experts believe the way to go is more enlightenment and regular screening, especially for men who are predisposed to prostate cancer. Preventing and also making these things you know, easier for the healthcare force in general. So I want to still say it's commendable. They, this cancer gives you like six years laxity, you know, before it becomes very aggressive. So it's within that period for people that are above 45 years that we want to capture these at the budding stage, at the early stage, before it becomes very, very aggressive. And it's something that you can easily detect from a digital examination. It might sound, oh, to most men and all that, I don't want a doctor going to examine me in that way and all that, you know? So we, we need to get over this um, traditional barrier. Emphasis has been on female cancers, cervical cancer, utero, cancer of the uterus and all that. So it's time to think of our male folk, you know, who are the folk of the families there? Uh, firstly, we have to thank God and we, we are very, very happy today. It is not normal day because uh, it is something very, very humanitarian. It is for people and um, uh, as a doctor explained that uh, uh, ca prostate cancer is, is quite very, very uh, critical uh, and it can be easy thing if it uh, uh, captured in early stages. So uh, we learn a lot today and uh, we feel proud to participate in this thing. Um, uh, we are being invited uh, from uh, a foundation, uh, charity foundation called uh, uh, Dozi Embossy, and uh, 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 we have the boss to convert it into an, uh, a mobile, uh, uh, not clinic, but a, a, a clear, a, a complete a scanner for uh, cancer, uh, prostate cancer. And uh, we have done it here. Uh, we design it first, and then we uh, we make all the installation and the other things uh, by Nigerian minds and by Nigerian hands. And uh, and if you will go inside, you'll be very proud, very proud about what what we have achieved. Prostate cancer is marked by an uncontrolled malignant growth of cells in the prostate gland located between the bladder and in front of the rectum. Though prostate cancer shows no symptoms 
most of the time, but the presence of blood in the urine or semen and difficulty in urinating are major symptoms. With Nigeria Medical Association, and I think it's a right step because we have a pool of specialists, we have a pool of doctors, and of course it's also in line with our own um, initiative, which is to look for the healthcare of the nation as well as the welfare of the people. So if they want to partner with us like they have approached us, I think it's just a welcome idea to say we are handling something that pertains to the health of the nation and we will give in our best to support them. We were told that this was as men to always uh, check ourselves. I learned a lot today, I'll tell you, I wouldn't lie to you, I learned quite a lot today and uh, I just registered myself, I'll go do my test and, and all that. It's a great initiative from uh, Mobosi, uh, Dozi Mobosi Foundation. This, uh, this is a very great one, and I, I hope that um, they can get to every nook and cranny of this country with this with this message. It's important that men should do that. Just the way women deal with breast cancer, men deal with prostate cancer. So it, it's important we, we go get tested and work on it. The risk factors for prostate cancer include family history, high fat diet, and obesity. The Director General, National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAVDAC, Professor Mojisola Deyeye, has urged Nigerians to develop good and healthy eating habits to boost their health immunity to fight diseases. Speaking at a forum of women pharmacists in Lagos, Professor Adeyeye said if people eat right, they will not need medicines. We use good food, best practices in terms of eating, uh, you will use less, less drugs. You eat better, nutritious food, which we regulate, you will use less medicine. So medicine and food go hand in hand. The better you eat in terms of nutrition, the less medicine you use. So in terms of uh, NAVDAC, we of course start with water. Uh, it is every day. We have to go after those who are not making uh, the water in an hygienic way, not using good manufacturing practices. Why? Because water can kill, as simple as it is, especially for children. The NAFDAC boss also touched on the role of women in terms of pharmaceutical manufacturing in Nigeria, in terms of pharmaceutical manufacturing in Nigeria, and how to tackle the issue of drug abuse among youths. Limitless, the role that women can play in terms of uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, pharmaceutical manufacturing, distribution, dispensing, community pharmacy, hospital pharmacy. You can just see the evidence uh, today. How many lady pharmacists are here? When we set our minds to something, we do it. Our brains are wired to make sure that whatever we start, we complete in terms of project. Uh, for NAVDAC, distribution of medicines was mentioned. And we have digitalized the way medicines will be distributed in Nigeria. And uh, NAVDAC is the first country in Africa, or first uh, regulatory agency, to use what is called GS1 traceability system to make sure that our drug distribution is more visible. Uh, so that is just an example. You have heard about uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients manufacturing. And uh, EMZO, the MD is a woman pharmacist, uh, is leading the way. And NAVDAC is working hand in hand with that process. Uh, talk of uh, regulation in general. We self-regulate ourselves as women in our different pharmacies, but uh, in terms of regulation and NAVDAC, we have turned we have turned NAVDAC around to be one of the few agencies in the world that have global best practices, using good regulatory practices, using good reliance practices. About to have measles campaign, measles vaccination campaign across all the 20 local governments and the 57 and um, the 37 LCDs in Lagos State. The eligible age for this measles vaccination are the children that are nine months old to 
five years. One dose of the vaccine is approximately 85% effective at preventing the measles, which means if a child takes the first dose at nine months, the child only has 85% chance of getting the immunity. But if the child goes for the second dose, the child has a 97% chance of becoming fully uh, immunized against this disease. This is a, a vaccination that's to commence on the 17th. We require support from everyone. So support from the government, the media, support from the uh, CDC, that is the uh, that's the, uh, the, the chairman uh, uh, development committee, all the CDAs. So we want support from all, all and sundry. So it is when we work together that we can ensure that we make Lagos free of measles. This vaccination will also be complemented with vitamin A supplement and COVID-19 vaccines. Measles is a deadly viral infection that spreads through the air by respiratory droplets produced from coughing and sneezing. It affects children and is easily preventable by vaccination. Measles presents in a form of a runny nose, cough, uh, redness of the eye, and a rash, a typical rash that starts from the face. So, and if a child has measles, in an environment, that child could have, will infect other 18 or more children around him or her. And uh, how does it spread? Through the secretions from the nurseries and from the throat. Once it's getting, another child gets in contact with the secretions, the other child will come down with this measles. And as well, that child could also, also you know, spread the disease to another 18 or more children. And just like that, running like that and spreading across you know that community or other places around the area that starts from the face in nigeria over 10,000 cases are recorded annually the first side of things to come from this organization so okay. Okay. 600 parks out of the 10,000 parks promised reusable parts were handed over to the Media Part campaign team on Wednesday, 1st June 2022. Another branch will be delivered in September and December 2022, respectively. And uh, we came across the good work they were doing uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, our chairman committed uh, to uh, contributing a total of 10,000 um, reusable menstrual pads in the first instance as a show of support um, for uh, the work the company uh, is doing and that remains our commitment. So this uh, ceremony uh, represents uh, the first installment um, of that promise we have made. The people can still support us to get some of these items so that when it gets to the hand of a girl she feels that um, she, she, she matters. What we intend to do beyond tackling period poverty is also to bring about the situation where our girls have period dignity. We want them to be to feel a sense of pride that they're women and to feel dignified. One of the things you're also working at is creating and providing toilets for these girls um, in places where we go and we see that you do not have the right changing spaces and toilets in the school or in the community. I suppose that's the next uh, phase that we're going into. But for now, we're going to ensure that these disposable, um, reusable pads uh, get to women and girls in various communities across Nigeria. Of what she's been doing over the last couple of years has been phenomenal. And you know, the fact that someone like um, Platform is coming to support her, I think is testimony to the credibility and the impact of the work that she's been doing. Um, I'm also really happy to see that, I'm also very happy to see that um, the, the donation by platform is of reusable parts because it's important that sustainability is built in. And that's it. It's very easy to maintain. All you need to be able to 
care for your pads is water, lots of water, and just a little soap. You wash it properly, clean it, and after cleaning it, we also always advise our girls to clip it back, just to ensure that there are no, nothing falls on the pad anyways, really. So you clip, you clip the pad back properly. It's very pretty. Aesthetics was a big consideration for us while using this to avoid any, any. Beyond the sanitary pad campaign, the NGO is also into mentoring of young girls. Beginning, we want the rate of out-of-school girls to decrease. We want our girls to go to school even in their periods. So we want them to be brilliant in school. One of the uh, partner organizations is a dance academy where the girls learn how to dance and make a living from dancing at the same time going to school. That typifies the sort of thing we want. We want the girls to come to the full realization, to, be, to, to have agency to come to the full realization that nothing is impossible for them to achieve if they put their minds to it. Though period poverty is a global problem that affects about 500 million women worldwide, Nigeria alone accounts for about 37 million of this population, a situation that has worsened with the high cost of sanitary products. Research is capable of improving a country's economic prosperity or a country's profile in the scientific uh, area. And they're also capable of improving even our image when we start to do groundbreaking research that contributes to health security of the world. Like water is to life, so is research to healthcare delivery in any society. Through research, Information about disease trends, risk factors, outcome of treatments, or public interventions, and lots more have helped people live longer, healthier lives. This is exactly what NIMA is doing for the nation's health sector and can do more if supported by governments at all levels, corporate organizations, and individuals. Watch NIMA at a glance on Health Affair on AIT. Support research. <coughs> uh, customer, here are the tomatoes. What else shall I give you? Hot pepper and. <coughs> ah, 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 Auntie, this your cough is getting out of hand now. Uh, take it easy ah. with her now. Eh? Uh, but, customer, this is your cough. You should go to the hospital. You know I can't go there with this cough at this time. They'll just say I have COVID 19. Customer, <coughs> every cough is different. It could be tuberculosis. It's true, Auntie. Check her more. Make your day sure. Because who no go? No go, no! Check that cough for tuberculosis. Check her more, check her more. Make your day sure. If your cough is more than two weeks, it could be tuberculosis. TB tests and TB treatment are free. Just call the National TB Hotline on 3340 for information on where to get the test. This message is brought to you by the Federal Ministry of Health with support from the American people. Welcome back. In the quest for improved living condition, many Nigerians are caught in the web of human trafficking and illegal migration. Most vulnerable groups are the women, young girls, and children who are deceived into forced prostitution, organ arresting, and child labor. We have with us on the program the Director of Public Enlightenment, NAPTIP, Mr. Josiah Emerule to brief us more on the ugly situation and emerging trends. Like my director general will describe it as a crisis. It has gone beyond a problem, but now a crisis because 
many young people have suffered in the hands of traffickers. As you push through one area, they escape through the other area. And because people want to make money at all costs, people want to shed blood to get money, they do not even care whether it involves their relative or any person, so long as it is the money from trafficking, they are ready to go for it. I'm sure you are aware that trafficking globally is worth 150 billion United States dollars in terms of profit in the hands of the criminal gangs and because they have such funds, they are ready to kill anybody that stands on their way. And Nigeria is also part of the country where they harvest these victims from. I remember too that we also have two types of trafficking. We have the internal trafficking and we have the external trafficking. But people make a lot of money through the external trafficking because of the foreign currency that is involved. But the truth is that internal trafficking, the volume of internal trafficking is more than the volume of external trafficking as far as Nigeria is concerned. When we talk about external trafficking, we are talking about the movement of victims from one country to another country. And internal trafficking has to do with movement of victims and the exploitation of those victims from one community to the other or from one state to the other. Now, you are asking, what are these drivers of trafficking? We talk about poverty which is ravaging everywhere. And mind you, it's also a global problem. So people now capitalize, the criminal elements capitalize on the poverty of certain people and go to deceive them and then promise assistance, become good Samaritans who have suddenly come out to help such people to raise their children. And they tell them that there are greener pastures outside of their own comfort zone, but they end up taking these people through very dangerous routes, especially through the desert, looking for the route to the Mediterranean Sea and how they can cross the Mediterranean Sea to Europe, where they are now exploited. And mind you, their travel documents have also been seized by these people. You don't understand the language in those places. You don't understand the road in those places. You don't know who to report to. They suffer in silence. And then, before you know it, you see a video shows up about what they are going through. They are asking for help. And Nigeria will continue to spend the meager resources that would have been used for something else to look for how to bring back these victims through NAPTI and through other partners. Young girls and children are the most affected in this issue of trafficking because of the sexual exploitation that comes because these young people, they find them more attractive for sex and they take them to more of these places. Even within the country, some of them are kept in brothels where men come in pay amount of money to the madams or the masters that kept them there and then they go have sex with these young people, young girls, in fact even children because many of them are still within the limit of children and they have sex with them and these young people don't even enjoy the proceeds of those 
uh, those exploitations because what they do is that they give them what they want, whatever they want them to eat. And these things come with a lot of price for these young people. One, the education of those people are already destroyed. The health situation that comes into it, the health hazards, because a situation where you make a young girl, a young girl, sleep with between 15, 20 men a day, and they end up having a lot of diseases. Some of them lose their wounds. Some of them come with all manner of sicknesses that their parents, who ordinarily were expecting that when this my daughter comes home, they will help us come out of poverty. You end up enlarging the cycle of poverty that is the family because most times when these health problems come, they are thrown out of the streets. Now, you carry a child who is under 12 and you say this child goes to serve somebody as a domestic help. The Trafficking in Persons Prohibition Act 2015 say you cannot do that. Because the Trafficking in Persons Act says that you cannot employ such a child as a domestic help. That is, <clears throat> that is slavery. Because, and that one is that so long as that child is found in your house and it is known that this child something was somebody was earning something for the labor this child is doing there then that is trafficking and it does not matter what has happened and secondly if a child that is also there you are now maltreating this child abusing this child and getting this child to do things that will affect his or her own development including not going to school including made to lift objects that are that is incapable of doing it's also an additional problem but in our country today you have many houses people want to show how big they are by the number of servants they have in the house and instead of them to go and look for people who have come of age people who can work and earn their pay back from them they are looking for young people and some traffickers they go to the villages recruit these people in the area of uh, sale of babies for us in napti we call it buying and selling of a human being because that is what the law calls it so it does not matter whether he is a baby or a full-fledged human being so long as the human beings have been sold it is a crime but in our country today it is the children that have been sold to the highest bidder in the name of adoption now sale of children or sale of human beings is a crime against the child against the state now what this could do is they go to certain people talk about some young girls probably who got pregnant out of wedlock get them into a particular place promise them all manner of things that they will take care of them they should deliver the child they will help them take care of the child and all that most times they don't even tell the girls that they will take the delivery of the child they just say we will help you in some cases they bring some young girls who they have taken from various places deceive them and bring some young people to having sex with them where they i mean impregnate them so that they can have babies for them to exchange for money and unfortunately at times when these children deliver, they just give them some peanuts and drive them away with a threat of reporting them to their parents since they now run away from home so that their parents will not know that they got pregnant for anybody.
and the poor children at time because they don't want the parents to know that this was what they did especially these ones in the highest decisions the parents will be thinking that they are in school but they are in somewhere and then what do these people do they now bring in some people who are looking for children tell them that the baby is available and they sell make you feel that they can give you adoption papers genuine adoption papers most time they provide adoption paper but most uh, and you know, in most cases these adoption papers are fake because we have had lots of cases in that in that area and we were able to go to the courts where they say they worked on it go to the clinics where they say they worked on it go to the ministries of women affairs and social development of the state where they said this adoption was done and you saw that there is no documentation so they just deceive those people and sell these children to them and those people will go and do the ceremony do dedication and claim that they delivered and the other thing is the one they call cryptic pregnancy certain so-called local uh clinic attendants in some places we work with certain women give them certain herbs that makes their tummy to bloat claiming that they have they are pregnant and they will tell them don't go for scan because scan will not see it don't go to any other facility because they will not be able to do it okay within so so, -so week come we will deliver you and you will see the tummy big all those things where and then you'll be carrying as a woman you'll be carrying it within your vicinity people will see that you are pregnant deceiving everybody and then on the so-called day of delivery you go to that facility they do whatever thing they want to do so and the tummy will come down it could be a child they have stolen it could be a child they have gotten through some of these other girls they will not present the baby to you and you go ahead and claim that you have delivered a baby and you go home there are so many of such cases that are with us and this happens on daily basis now the one of orphanage trafficking that we're talking about what are we talking about certain people they will go and build a place or hire a place and call it an orphanage they will go to certain families orphanages are supposed to be places for children who do whose parents are no longer there who need support who need help and you bring them there to help them but what we are seeing these days some of the or many of these orphanages we are talking about are homes where people have established to make money bring children whose parents are alive and they will tell the parent that they want to see how they can help these children go to school but it's not happening they just bring them to the place and use them to raise funds for themselves you see many people you want to do your birthday they'll say ah you don't want to celebrate it at home you want to do it in one of any to help support orphans they will tell you go to so 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 orphanage that is there you go there carry bags of rice carry meal carry everything carry money and go there to celebrate at the end of the day those people are just collecting your money they are not using it for those children because first of all those children are not orphans some of them in the night they will take them back to their homes in the morning they are brought back organ harvesting is part of human trafficking and even the trafficking in persons protocol recognizes it as trafficking and when we talk about this what are we looking at we are looking at where people are abducted and taken to some places where their organs are harvested we are looking at places where people even offer certain people money so that their organs can be taken with the claim that okay 
your kidneys, you have two kidneys. So some person needs a kidney. If you take one out, it can regenerate. Or you take one out, you only need one to survive. And they deceive them. In some cases, the young people especially fall into this trap because of the rich get rich quick syndrome. And they think that it is true. You have heard that, oh, a social person went to do it and he collected two million, mm -hmm. three million, four million. And then you position yourself that those that family they approached you. They are well to do. Most times, you discover that they will take you to the facility, wherever it is, and take that organ. You do not also have a way of knowing what and what they took from you. You have agreed that it's one kidney you want. They are to take, they could take other things without you knowing because they have closed you up. Now, they may give you the money that you have agreed with them, but the fact is that they will go there and take care of their own person who has received the organ that is involved. But nobody takes care of you. But they, for them, they, have, they feel they have paid you, off, paid you off. And you just walk away. And when your health challenge now starts, nobody cares. Most of you may not even open up to say this was what happened. It's a lot of challenge to a lot of people. That's why mothers need to keep preaching to their children. No matter how poor you are, it is better that you are with your children. If it is palm kernel that you could have to eat to survive, manage it. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? Human trafficking especially this area of organ harvesting has become a very serious business across the world where one organ costs a lot of money in the black market some figures have been thrown up there by various organizations but i would not want to throw out those figures but the figures are very scary why these people also become very vicious in taking people. Why the so-called Yahoo Yahoo Plus people or Plus Plus are getting involved in some of these things? Our advice is that people, parents, should join us in this fight. Don't say because you want money to be brought in. Begin to ask how is that money gotten? You need to ask how much that money is gotten. That your relative that is saying, let me go and help your child. Please, open your eyes and ask needed questions so that your child does not become the next victim of human trafficking. You are just joining us is Health Affair on AIT and next on the program is our nutrition segment. It's a common saying that you are what you eat. This is why we make it a point of duty to give you information about food items, fruits, and their nutritional value to help you make healthy choices on our nutrition segment every week. We welcome adverts from food and beverage manufacturing companies on this segment. Jute or salad leaves, properly called a widu among the Yorubas, is a prominent vegetable in West Africa, rich in sustenance, possessing other medical advantages. A wedu leaf is low in calories, high in vitamins and minerals, an adequate source of fiber, helpful in dealing with weight management, and may also promote intestinal health by helping with bowel movement. A wedu leaf contains the antioxidant trial of vitamins A, C, and E, which fence off free radicals, thereby protecting the body from degenerative diseases, boost immunity, and nourishing the body, the leaf is used to prepare the popular Ewedu soup, mostly eaten with Amala. Please come with me to our clinical segment for tips on healthy living.
people shouldn't throw away their hygiene. They should keep on washing their hands, keep good hygiene, and make sure that uh, they keep the environment clean. And lastly, as a pharmacist, if a drug is not prescribed, don't use it. If you must use the drug, ask the pharmacist. I went to value your contributions on how to improve human lives and the nation's critical infrastructure. You can see that like, nearly every family now has a youth taking one drug or the other. Nobody's an exception. As much as possible, we need to go out there. We cannot just stay within the um, enclosure of our hospitals. But people have been doing, doing that. But we need to intensify the action more to go out and educate as much as possible. When you talk about the issue of drugs, we are talking about the availability. Many of these drugs are not made in Nigeria. It was one of those so, the entry ports, I, the, the ports are the ports because as much as possible. They need to intensify the effort of seizing all these drugs. Those that are told, that come in as much as possible, we should. Like, many of the youth have told us, they got these drugs from our, from our pharmacies. Of the people you see here. Pharmacists are supposed to sell drugs, drugs with prescription from doctors. At least that is how it still stands today. I will urge government to, to intensify this effort. We know that some of the cough syrup that uh, people were taking with one that was with what you put in, many of these. They are no longer, the they are not available the without prescription. But they are still being Senior sold, either in After open markets or in some uh, retail markets Students that people are getting it. So we still need to intensify much progress. effort in curtailing the availability of the drugs. This is where we wrap up the program today. Thanks for spending your time with us. Let's do it again same time next week. And please do not forget advertise your health products and services with us at a very subsidized rate. My name is Oshuo Mo Danis. Please keep staying safe.